to just cut off. Maybe we could carry on with your comment, Esther. Thank you. I was saying, I was thinking um, what, what strength based uh, conversation I would have liked to see with my kid uh, in the context of, of their gender. And I think it would be in, in uh, Wendy was just talking about what that strength base is about trust. I think I would like to see a conversation with kids about how they have the strength of knowing themselves. And our role is just around giving them words or creating a supportive space around them so that they can tell us and express themselves fully as themselves rather than seeing the corridor around gender identity and gender diversity as uh, a problem that they have to overcome mm. and uh, a challenge or a difficulty that the challenges are in the world outside and they are not inside them. Mm. They know who they are and our role is just to if they need it to facilitate that. Mm. I Sorry. Just yeah. That, I find that technique, uh, that approach really beneficial, especially working with young people who, um, especially if they're kind of early on in their journey, um, coming out is so stressful and telling someone you don't really know can be so stressful. So responding to it instead of like something to overcome or a challenge as something exciting and unique and like a really cool thing about them can really undercut a lot of that anxiety and turn it into something to be excited about as well. Mm -hmm. Kyora, Kyora. Cooper, was there uh, um, any um, comment that really stood out from your group? I'd love to hear from everybody's comments, but we just haven't got time. But um, anything from your group? Uh, uh, there was so much fantastic stuff. Um, um, uh, there, so just, I guess I'll summarise it. Um, centering the person um, and taking um, them at their word that they know who they are and being their guide. Um, um, and not undermining who they are. Um, that, uh, that, was, that was fantastic and that was from a young person. Um, uh, focusing on building a relationship with them um, so that they feel confident um, in, in your, your work with them. Um, and to do that, um, actually I'll get into that later because that's what I was going to talk about anyway. Um, and there was something else that was really good. Um, uh, noticing them um, and that is taking on board not just um, that what they're saying to you verbally but also taking on non-verbal cues um, and just them as a whole person um, and a message I got as well um, was focusing on protective factors finding out what they're doing well and uh, nurturing that um, and one other thing was um, uh, being power enhancing and not um, dictating to them you're a great, um, lovely Koro, that's fantastic. Um, we had a little summary slide, um, which really says the same things as all of you have said. So <laughs> yeah. Listening and reflecting back, um, helping them to identify their strengths. And sometimes people do need a little bit of help, um, but yeah, in the light of their protective factors and that's their community around them as well, you know, all those strengths that they bring. So fantastic. So. Um, we thought that was really important in terms of starting off talking about um, um, gender with, with a young person, but with, with anybody really. Um, but we just want to kind of cover a little bit about um, the context for, from which we deliver our, our gender diverse um, service. We've probably been seeing, gosh, gender diverse people since the turn of the century. We've probably seen, I haven't, you're right, Rebecca, we need more data. But we've probably had, because the numbers keep growing all the time, we see new people almost every day. Um, and we've probably seen, I would say, probably up to 150 young people in the last 10 years, but um, mostly in the last four or five. Um, but a youth one stop shop is a, is a, it provides a combination of services, including um, um, health development and well being of young people, it's holistic all around um, service. Um, confidential, obviously, free of charge, um, youth specific strengths based and the positive youth development approach. Um, and there's probably about 14 or 15 of us around the country now, some recognized by government um, and some not. Um, 
but we try and kind of loosely um, band together in what we call the network of youth one-stop shops or ENYOS. Um, we've probably helped around 50,000 young people in Aotearoa each year um, and we're community-based. We definitely focus on well-being, um, easily accessible, um, usually on a bus route or in the center of um, town, um, holistic, and we yeah, support young people between 12 and 24. Um, well, and some of us 10. Um, and we help with obviously health issues, but also homelessness, education, jobs and training. Um, suicide prevention to me is doing all of those things um, and addressing barriers, especially for young people who are different. Um, and that's obviously, um, and, and we have a kind of a real heart for um, trans and gender diverse young people and rainbow people. Um, maybe just put in the chat now, what form does peer support take in your area? If you have a local YOS, do they provide peer support? Um, and who does most of the gender care in your area? I had the privilege of catching up with Daniel Longchamp from Taranaki. She's the only health professional at the moment that she knows of who's doing gender diversity um, hormone treatment, never mind peer support. So um, yeah, just pop in the chat. Um, what, what do you have in your area? Um. And this is really important because we want to record this because it's part of our, the DHB survey, which I know um, is going to be reported on later on, but it would be nice to know what kind of exists now so that we meet the challenge of, of filling the gap. And if you could um, type it in so that it goes to everyone, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Well, there's not so currently an everyone option. Yeah. Um, so, okay, sweet. So um, maybe if you just send it so to... Um, uh, everyone is not an option. Oh, here we go. I'll read them out because I can see them. Everyone isn't an option. Um, there's no peer support. Yes, yeah, so that's frequently. Yeah, that's coming up quite frequently now. Yep. Yep. There isn't any peer support. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think Rainbow Youth around the country does a good good job, and Inside Out obviously as well. But um, yeah, one on one peer support is often missing. Yep. So informal stuff. Yep. Uh, on the West Coast is not even anybody who does gender care. Yeah, gender minorities in Wellington do. Yeah, cool. So this is important we can share with others. Um, nothing formal in the Manawatu. Yep. Um, Yasin Wanganui does. Yep. Auckland Rainbow Youth, obviously, yep, outline NZ. Some Facebook groups, cool. Um, obviously, Rainbow mm. Youth, yep. I know that, like, from my 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 personal experience, um, my my own peer support that I received was Facebook groups. That's yeah. how I got through my transition. Yeah. Cool. Keep keep um, typing those on. Um, that will be really important. Like I said, to help us um, fill the gaps where where they are, and it looks like there's a lot of them. Um, okay, so um, we. Also, could we get so, that? Sorry, can we? Uh, so, could you please repeat the name of the person in Taranaki? Uh, hang on, let me just have a wee look if I can find it again. Um, so, who's in Taranaki? Um, we've got Toronga, Gender Dynamics and Rainbow Youth, um, and Transform in Wellington. Um, Wellington has some good services, it's great, because um, also Evolve does as well. Um, Porirua is just about to get a youth one-stop shop. Um, I can't see Taranaki Cooper. Um, there it is. Um, whoever was from Taranaki, could you please say your name? <laughs> if you could repeat it again, that would be awesome. Um, cool. 
I've also just got messages um, that we've got um, in, uh, in uh, don't think there's much in North Canterbury. Um, nothing running in rural areas. The difference is not always accepted. Um, yeah. Village Collective in South Auckland is the, um, I've got acronyms here, I'm pretty sure this stands for Auckland Sexual Health Centre um, and oh, CFYH, I think that's Children and Family Youth Health in Auckland from memory. Yeah. Um, in Timaru, we've got youth groups run by YMCA um, and I'm involved in creating an, a group for 17 to 25 year olds based at an art with the help of YMCA. Um, and adults served by adult medicine. Um, there's youth group projects um, like Project Youth in Kapiti, um, run by Kapiti Youth Support. Oh, I've got a correction. It's a Centre for Youth Health um, that is based in South and West Auckland. Um, in Hamilton, there is a sexual health clinic um, that does gender affirming care for 16 and up. Um, there's Modi Order, um, student health and counselling. Um, okay, so that's really, really awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I know that, and I know that there's also um, uh, support in um, Otiputi um, in yeah. um, Otago. So, so keep keep contributing as we keep talking. Um, the lovely Rebecca Nichols. Do you want to talk to these slides? <laughs> I believe that was a no. <laughs> <laughs> nice try so Rebecca um, amazingly got um, totally shocked by um, uh, well not amazing that she got shocked but by the Counting Ourselves research and um, um, gosh all totoku to Jamie and the team for doing this research it was absolutely um, fundamental I think to a lot of big changes happening around transgender care um, um, but you know it, it really revealed how how really hard it is for transgender people in 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 yeah in Aotearoa really um and how their mental health really suffered um for all sorts of reasons um and Rebecca um was really triggered by the fact um that we need to improve um the mental health of transgender people um and so <laughs> Rebecca is somebody who never takes no for an answer um, and she really um, kept persisting um, with our DHB. Um, and she has negotiated this package of care where it's $900 um, plus GST for 12 months for each individual. And they can choose um, a peer support worker or a psychologist. And obviously how many hours you get with each depends on charges. Um, and um, setting up some money for setting up emergency fund like a binding library and um, peer support supervision. Um, and so a, an amazing package of care, both for um, really um, gender diverse people of all ages, but also for supporting the peer supporters. Yeah, um, um, sorry, so I'm just gonna, um, we're just cutting it, we're getting close to time. So um, if it's all right, I'll get, um, I'll jump over and do the, I'll share my yep. thing now, if that's all right. Yep. And Two finish seconds. this bit off. So what but the most important thing though is the referrals can come from anybody, um, any GP, um, and uh, the support is really great. Um, and we we do the young people one at 298, Qtopia does the peer support for any age, and then psychologists come from all different backgrounds and they can all be referred to, which is fantastic. Um, so 298 has a general um, structure I won't go into that too much, but we like to think we're circular. Um, and yeah, over to you, Cooper. All right, kia ora. Um, so, um, don't know, hopefully people can see my screen. Um, I'm not going to show you around 298 right now because we don't really have time. Um, but I'm just going to talk really quickly about um, how we actually provide the care um, at 298. Um, so, briefly, um, so we do uh, trans peer support, um, but because we're a one-stop shop, we also have doctors, nurses, um, and counsellors. Um, some of our patients are registered with us already and they get our full service, but people who are referred to us from external GPs, um, they 
get the package of care, um, which is um, based on um, the funding that Sue just um, Super. spoke about. I'm really sorry to interrupt you. I've just had yep. a couple of messages coming through saying that Sue needs to stop sharing. Okay, cool. It looks like that's been sorted. Okay, cool. Sweet. Um, cool. So, um, so really quickly, uh, so Maki, uh, Maki share, had that. Cooper, if you just share your screen. It's, okay. Unless you want me to do the slides. People, okay. Um, I'll do that. Share screen. Um, yeah, okay, just share the slides if you want. Okay. Um, anyway, so I, how I did my PPIO earlier, um, that's not really useful with um, patients who come in. Uh, so I, I do um, a more Pākehā version and a youth-friendly version. I just say, kia ora, um, I'm Cooper, I've been a youth worker for 15 years, uh, grew up here, got a cat, coach roller derby, um, and just tell them a bit of more fun stuff about me. Um, I then uh, explain what services, how confidentiality works. I do a DAS21 score, so that's depression, stress, anxiety scale. Um, then I do a heads assessment, um, so that goes into um, it's a psycho psychosocial assessment tool which identifies both risk and protective factors and it assists um, all health professionals to formulate a, a plan with, in partnership with, a, um, with rangatahi um, to, to support them. Um, and, and that plan is a goal and support plan um, that covers home and whānau, education, employment, activities and peers, physical well-being, mental well-being, and purpose and belonging. And that really encompasses um, te whāri tapa whā. Um, so uh, peer support, the, the two of the foundations of it, it's um, representation, so that's validation and hope. So I've had um, Rangatahi come in and say, oh my God, you're trans and you're alive. Um, and that's, that's pretty big. Um, it's lived experience, so it's mentoring and shared understanding. Um, so, you know, the fact that, uh, th these are quotes, sorry. The fact that I have a po uh, can have a positive role model um, that's trans too, it inspires me and gives me hope for the future. Um, it is supported and reinforced by Te Whare Tapa Whā, um, networking with the trans and gender diverse communities, trauma-informed care, positive youth development, um, spoon theory, um, and body doubling. So that's a tool for ADHD people. Um, so, uh, uh, you're like a, a, in between a professional counselor and a friend, having a neutral person who is on your side, who you can just talk to about day-to-day -day life and motivate me to do things that I don't manage to do. Um, main sources of information, I make sure that I get everything from um, informed places, so PATHA, Gender Minorities, Aotearoa, Healthline, Health Pathways, um, Rainbow Youth, Inside Out, etc. cetera. Um, there's some other quotes, I'll provide this later. Um, but one thing that's really fundamental, I think, is that um, is um, something that uh, someone said in the chat before about um, oh, I don't get the word right now, but um, a genuine want to understand bangatahi, um, and that comes across in a quote here. Um, if there's something that you don't know, you don't you're not going to shoot it down and say that's not a, that doesn't sound like a thing. Instead, you're going to go away and educate yourself. A lot of health professionals don't go further than what they know from formal education. And that's a lot of what peer support's about. Um, yeah, I think we should possibly skip the rest and go through the Q&A, though. Um, yeah. Sure, thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, I'm Kelly. I'm the moderator for this session. Um, and thank you very much, Cooper. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, and uh, Rebecca and Samantha, we've got a, a few questions for your talk. Uh, the first one is, could you please elaborate on the difference between the gatekeeping and informed consent model? Sorry, Kelly, it's hard with the feed, the echo here to <laughs> quite pick up that question. Sorry, was it for Samantha or for I? And, and is Samantha here? I can't see her on the chat. Uh, it, the question was, what's the difference between the gatekeeping and informed consent models? Samantha, are you here and do you want to speak to that or do you want me to? It might be us. That might be us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Bit of, bit of all us. Why don't you start with that, Jean? Um, I think 
informed consent takes a really radically different approach um, to just how we relate to patients. So, and it's something that we're I and my the work that I do where I get to train with GPs and talk about informed consent to our community. Um, really try to explain the difference between these two things because our community historically has um, kind of really had has just been a gate gate kept out of the whole thing almost always right so so many of us have kind of had to been um, coached you know in preparation for readiness assessments or to see endocrinology and very have, you know has been for a long time you've got to provide the right answers to the questions in order to access care um, whereas informed consent is not about providing the right answers it's not about yes or no you know having the right answers to the right questions it's about really getting a generous and holistic understanding of the client or patient in front of you in order to provide the best care that we can so um, I try to communicate with the um, peer support clients that I work with who are going to inform consent that you know they don't have to have the right answers you know you don't have to go into it saying the right thing in order to access care informed consent when it works the way it's supposed to, um, you should get the best outcome for you in every case. So I, I just like to add to that and from the general practice perspective, because that's what I am, um, is really it's what I do every day with mm. every medication. It's it's um it's what I do if I put you on a blood pressure medication. That's what I do if we were talking about, you know, which way you want to go with your cancer treatment. It really is just what we do, which is explore for that person their understanding um, about the medication and the risks and the benefits and uh, and the risks of not doing something versus doing it and then mm. just have a discussion around that really and what's what's meaningful to, to the patient to the, for them to guide me and what their choice might be going forward really. So to, I think a lot of uh, clinicians when they hear about it are a bit fearful but actually when you point out it is a hundred percent what you do every day in mm. your normal work then suddenly it all starts to click for people really mm. and there's uh, uh, yeah. hi Rebecca sorry I, I wasn't able to unmute myself so thank you for unmuting me so yeah I totally agree with a lot with what you've said so just I think there's a very important distinction here that we're not quite getting with the difference between gatekeeping and informed consent. Like Rebecca, you've said everything we do in medicine is a form of gatekeeping, except, you know, <laughs> For, fun, for some funny reasons, we just feel that trans and non-binary people somehow cannot consent. And therefore we, we heighten, you know, this, this sort of sensitivity. We get them to jump through more hoops in order to get care and hence the gatekeeping. When actually gatekeeping and informed consent, they're just different levels of gatekeeping. You know, on one hand, a, a type of gatekeeping that we're previously doing was dehumanizing and, 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 you know, not very respectful of, of people's knowledge and their beliefs. But now I think we're moving towards another model. That's kind of how I view in, uh, the, 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 the swap, the change from what we traditionally know as gatekeeping model to the informed consent model. So that's all I want to add. Otherwise, everything else was brilliant. Thank you. Um, and uh, another question for you, Samantha, since you're here. Um, what M You mentioned a lack of MDT, uh, multidisciplinary team support uh, in the gender clinic you ran. What MDT support would you have liked to have been involved in that? Oh, sorry, I've been muted again. <laughs> Yeah, so I think in terms of MDT support, you know, I would really appreciate a psychologist to be able to work alongside me. And maybe even a social worker would be really helpful, somebody who who is able to, to you know, to, to help um, manage a broad ranging issues of the patients I see in my clinic. Oftentimes, you know, oh my gosh, the wind is so loud in my house. <laughs> um, oftentimes, uh, you know, I do the two hour assessment. Uh, I, I, I handle the medical side of things, including prescribing of medications or psychoeducation, but a lot of them are also struggling with really difficult uh, trauma or, or, or social issues that, that I personally don't have the expertise or, or, or capacity. Um, but having said that, I don't want people to misunderstand that, you know, the vast majority of people coming through the clinic are very resourceful, very robust. You know, they, they just want to 
get the letter that get the green light from me to go ahead for hormones and, and that's it but just a minority of them really need some extra help and and what i do certainly helps although i think that you know having having an mdt to support me and to support the patient alongside would be would be really really helpful and of course, uh, the other important thing about MDT is to have a backup psychiatrist to take over when I go and leave, because sometimes when I go and leave, you know, the wait list just backs up. And, and, um, and when I come back, I thought, oh my gosh, the wait times have ballooned to six months again. So it, it, it puts a lot of pressure on me to never, ever go away, ever, you know. <laughs> and uh, a question here for the whole panel. Uh, one person in the audience observes that resources are difficult to get if it's not a medicalized issue. Should we move towards a system that funds trans issues as a social um, issue, or do we compromise on the framing of trans issues for the sake of this access? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on that. I mean, it's both, right? Like, while our community still faces these really high, disproportionately high rates of mental distress compared to the general population, um, we just we need that support, right? But that should, support shouldn't just be available to those who kind of meet that threshold for um, mental health care, right? So I think definitely moving towards the social model, um, but until we are seeing equitable outcomes in terms of our health care, it still has to sit in the medical space as well, right? But it's, it's, a, it's about access, like access needs to be open to everyone who's trans, which is where the um, package of care here in Canterbury comes in great success because it's open to everyone regardless of age for whatever they need it for. So models like that, I think, are a really great approach. I would agree it's about social so, the social side. I, I think it, we're at a point in time now where um, care for um, gender diverse people is back back in the, at, like 20 years ago where rainbow um, sexual orientation, same sex orientation what was 10, 20 years ago. So we've got a lot of catching up to do, but at the same time, you do need some medical intervention, but actually making really good training for that medical intervention to be as part of the whole social stuff, I think is that to me, that's the way to go. Yep, I've got nothing to add, brilliantly put. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, I, I think um, that it, it, I mean when, when we um, when we look at the stats of um, uh, of distress with um, the whole rainbow population compared to um, non rainbow population, um, it's essential that um, more social supports are put in place, um, especially when we look at what is happening politically for um, trans and gender diverse population. It's not great. So yeah, but it needs to be medical as well. Hmm. Sorry, we've got <laughs> Esther wanting to jump in too. Kia ora. The rest of us in here as well. Just wanted to add that depending on the age in, in this life stage the person is in, um, having the extended community uh, involvement in, at some level. So having schools involved, if we're talking about children, the majority of their social life happens there uh, for older uh, young people or, or adults, um, making sure there's a supportive community and workplace in safe housing. So it's really a lot about um, us working and having relationship with, with community and people around us that are not strictly speaking health system, but they are very much part of creating that supportive environment. So I think that was a big part of our project in, in um, Canterbury that we very quickly recognised that it wasn't just going to be about, um, you know, the peer community and, mm. and GPs meeting up. And um, that's that complex slide I put up. But, you know, we had to engage with WINS and we had to engage with schools and, you know, all mm. of that. And they, mm. schools here um, put a lot of information on their kind of website platform thing for teachers around leading lights and all of those things had to interconnect. Mm. Otherwise, you know, there's, there's you're just blowing out all mm. over the place. So, it, yeah, part of it was, you know, including everybody, health and mm. kind of the wider stuff as well. And, um, in New Zealand, we're really lucky that PATHA is open to everybody in, mm. involved in the life of of trans folks, so um, not necessarily only clinicians. So we can all through that network connect and, and um, 
form those relationships. Just want to add, sorry, as well, is that there's also an, an, an inequity of care in terms of like um, te tiriti um, and, and th we're supposed to be doing equal uh, partnership in how we are providing healthcare and we only push one model um, and that's a problem. And if we were doing equal, that would actually be better for everyone because holistic care is better for everyone. Um, and that's something that generally needs to be done better overall. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, we've just hit 10.30, so uh, we're just going to break the morning tea. I want to thank all our speakers again and uh, everyone who answered questions. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll see you back here in 15 minutes for the next session. Yeah. Uh, kite, kika, ha.